Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to our fourth screencast on presuppositions. The previous screencast for the unit defined presuppositions and related concepts and provided some tests for presuppositions in addition to reviewing a handful of different case studies. For this screencast, I really want to use presuppositions as a kind of jumping off point for addressing the larger topic of framing and in particular political framing. As I say at the top here, framing in the relevant sense is fundamentally about choices. If I, as a speaker, want to communicate some proposition P, well, there are likely to be many ways to communicate P in my language. Which of the many options should I choose? Now, in thinking about that as a speaker, I might see that there are various issues in play. I could ask myself, which choice will make things easiest for me as a speaker or for my audience? Uh, which choice will generate the right pragmatic meanings when its content interacts with the Gricean maxims in the context? And finally, which choice will frame the issue from my desired perspective? Of course, all these questions are likely to interact and smart political communicators are aware of all these factors and seek to choose language that will best reflect their desired perspective. And they might in fact really hope that we don't even notice that the issue has been framed from their perspective. That's really true success in political framing where one's chosen frame seems to everyone to be the default or even the neutral frame. In truth, there really are no neutral frames. My discussion of framing is heavily influenced by the work of George Lakoff. Lakoff has published numerous articles and books on the topic of framing, and in that work he identifies three central tenets of framing. First, every word has a frame. That's the lack of neutrality that I mentioned before. Second, negating a frame evokes that frame. And that should sound familiar. That clearly connects with our hypothesis N for presuppositions. And third, evoking a frame reinforces that frame. So for framing, repetition is meaningful. And it might be key, in fact, to becoming for a frame the kind of default that no one notices is, in fact, a biased frame. Let's look at some examples to begin to suggest how wide-ranging this might be. Uh, consider sentence 56a, we relieved Ed of his chores. In framing theory, we might break that down into the frame given informally in G. The idea is that whenever relieve is used, it will bring along this frame as a kind of deep presupposition. And the frame says, the agent X is the reliever of pain. The patient Y is the blameless afflicted. And finally, there's a cause Z. So in our A example, we get to be the heroic relievers of pain, Ed is the blameless afflicted, and the chores are the cause of Ed's affliction. So that's easy enough. In the example, Ed was relieved from his pain, we have a passive sentence. Uh, the patient is in subject position, so Ed is the blameless afflicted again. The agent here is not explicitly mentioned, but the frame tells us there must be one, and it's the person or thing that helped Ed out somehow. And finally, the pain is clearly the cause of the affliction. When we move to example 56c, we can see why these examples might be ironic or odd now, right? The pool hustler relieved Sally of her money. To make sense of this, we have to assume that the pool hustler is the reliever of pain, Sally is the afflicted, and the money was the cause of her affliction. And since all that seems unlikely to be true, the example might sound sarcastic, for example. Example 56D is likely to have a similar ironic flavor, assuming that Ed likes vacations. When we get to the bare phrase hunger relief, most of the required players in the frame are not represented directly. We can infer that hunger is the cause, but we don't know who the afflicted are precisely, or who's going to be the reliever. And then the phrase tax relief piggybacks on that same strategy. Now, maybe by analogy with hunger relief, Taxes are the burden, and someone, presumably the taxpayers, need to play the role of blameless afflicted. More generally, the idea here is that frame analysis, as in G, uh, these are possible for every word and construction, and such breakdowns can help us understand how frames operate on people who hear them. Example 56 is a classic case that runs afoul of all three of Lakoff's tenets. If you're called a crook, you should not utter the word crook at all, even to negate the claim, as this will evoke and reinforce the frame. In 56, we see a clever and subtle reframing. The word democratic brings its own very positive frame in the U.S. context, and that puts Republicans at a framing disadvantage relative to Democrats, since any reference to the Democratic Party will evoke this positive frame. 
Strikingly though, by removing the adjectival suffix to create the phrase Democrat Party, the frame seems to disappear. It's such a small shift with such major implications for framing. In 59 and 60, we see frames concerning war and protection being used, stretched and pulled to provide a particular perspective via the presuppositions of the frames evoked here. And in 61, we see some examples of framing in action in the real world. So here, a democratic research firm is providing guidance to the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Land. And this is all about how different phrases evoke different frames for different groups. And finally, I couldn't resist a fun little sketch, a classic Daily Show interview with Frank Luntz. I should say that George Lakoff's work on framing is closely associated with progressive causes. Luntz, on the other hand, was, at least for a long time, Lakoff's counterpart on the right, though his positions and perspectives may have changed somewhat recently. Anyway, Luntz wrote numerous books on framing and consulted with many conservative politicians and activist groups. And he's just incredibly insightful about how frames work linguistically and cognitively. And he was outstandingly good at getting Republican politicians to follow his advice, which led the Republican Party to a level of discipline in terms of framing that Lakoff could only dream of for the left. Now, in this sketch, you see Luntz rapidly reframing issues to reflect particular perspectives. He's so good at it. And Samantha Bee is so funny that I think I'll just let them close out this short screencast for me. And Luntz understands imagery. For many years, the Republican Party has relied on his expertise as a pollster and strategist to hone their message. There is such a thing as security, moms. From renaming the estate tax the death tax, to helping label relaxed emission standards the Clear Skies Initiative, Luntz has made a brilliant career spraying perfume on dog turds. Another vital component? Language. When you want to communicate, even the sounds of the words matter. And the ideal is to use words that begin with the same letter. For example, this banner reads, Strengthening Social Security. That's a big improvement over the original text, creating vast new opportunities for Wall Street to generate enormous commissions without addressing the actual problem. I'm going to read you some words. Help me warm these up a bit. Okay. Drilling for oil. I would say responsible exploration for energy. Logging. I would say healthy forests. Manipulation. Explanation and education. Orwellian.